This uh, leaves the British government's narrative when we start to see this more and more of this evidence coming out. Uh, and it, do and, and, uh, uh, it doesn't just apply to, to munitions dumps and, and uh, torture going on. Uh, it's also about mm -hmm. the, uh, the recovery of, of people that are apparently uh, buried in rubble. Uh, and we have, yeah. uh, once again, another White Helmets video here uh, mm -hmm. showing, showing a child being recovered. Um, but there are more and more allegations, Vanessa, of, of children being deliberately mm. buried in the first place. Is this what we're understanding is going on? Yeah, I mean, um, what I'll do is just talk through um, what I, I basically yesterday I ended up speaking to not only officials on the ground who are carrying out investigations into what was happening um, during the occupation, but also to civilians who um, lived under that occupation. Um, and in this instance, it was the officials that gave me the statement that in their view, based on the evidence given to them by the civilians living in that area, um, what was remarkable is when these children went missing from their families, um, it is believed that they were somehow um, drugged or anaesthetized and they were then used as props in the various false flag um, events that were staged by the White Helmets, but not only by the White Helmets, by a number of players, including the terrorist factions themselves. Um, and so what he basically told me, that this is the official um, who was talking to me about what he has gathered from all of the information he's been given by the civilians there, is that the majority of civilians who lost children were unable to see those children before they were buried. Um, and so this intimates that these children were taken somehow from these families under certain circumstances. His belief is that they would wait for the Syrian jets to be overhead. Um, and then the people would run down to the basement. They would then cut the electricity, pour chlorine and similar into the area so people would start screaming. And then they would start filming. And at that point, the children would be taken, they would be anesthetized, and they would be then used as props in whatever event they were filming. Now, I have to stress, this is coming um, This is coming from an official who was talking to me about what the work that the research work he had been doing. So I still need to corroborate this with my own investigation. But after this film that you're watching, where we see the white helmets basically going immediately to the spot where the child is buried. So there is no search for this child. They seem to know exactly where the child is buried. And as they remove the rubble from this child, the child miraculously starts crying. Now, in any normal rescue situation, if this child had been buried genuinely under rubble, I don't think we would be hearing it crying the minute that it was released from that, from that grave, basically. So are we seeing at this point a child that had been previously drugged, pre-buried, and then uncovered in a, in a staged rescue operation? Now, this is all speculative, but based on what I heard yesterday, there is a very strong case that this is what is happening. And um, I think what is important, that, that the point that he made is one, that the parents who lost children were never able to see their children. In other words, they were not able to bury their children. They were told after the event that the children had died and had been buried in the graveyard. So these bodies were not seen by the parents. They were not allowed to attend any sort of funeral. So already, I mean, this is some kind of dreadful psychological warfare for these civilians, having already lost their children and then being deprived of seeing them before they died, before they were buried, sorry, and being able to prepare them for, for the funeral. Now, I also was introduced to um, another witness who had on the, um, in August 2013, he'd lost five children. And I was able to actually speak to him and to try and piece together his story from that day. And of course, August 2013 was Obama's red line chemical attack. Um, now, what he told me, and I'm reading through the notes because I, I don't want to get any element of this um, wrong. I want to be able to transfer it exactly as he told me. Um, so on this day, he was sleeping with his wife and five children on the first floor of his house. I then asked him, um, was there any ventilation in this room? He told me, yes, there were windows in this room and many of them were broken. So there was perfect sort of air circulation in this room. He was sleeping there with five of his children. One daughter, who's now 19, was staying with other relatives, but in the area. 
they were woken um, by screams of chemical attack. But at this point, he told me that two days prior, there had been rumors of an imminent chemical weapon attack. He couldn't remember where those rumors came from, potentially from the terrorist factions that were there. At that point, so after he had woken up, he actually started to pass out. Um, and he said that he felt dizzy. He felt as if he was being affected um, by some kind of, of drug. Um, he was then unconscious for eight hours. His wife told him later that she had managed to keep conscious for at least 30 minutes and she had tried to keep the children conscious by putting water on their faces. But she passed out, as I said, after 30 minutes. After eight hours, they woke up in another place, in the hospital in Kafrabatna, but without their children. He then spent 36 hours searching for his children and eventually he was told they were dead. So he went to Erbin Registration Center, which is in the same area, and he was shown a photo by the terrorist factions of three of his children, only three, two girls and a boy. Two girls are actually to this day still missing. His eldest daughter, his second eldest daughter, returned home from the relative where she'd been staying shortly after the incident, but she also suffered around 48 hours of nausea, headaches, and so on, which is what he and his wife also suffered when they came round after the eight hours of being unconscious. Um, he was told the children had been buried in Zamalka Cemetery before he was allowed to see them, and even to this day, he has no idea where they are buried or how they really died. He said to me there was no gas smell when he fell unconscious, but he did reiterate that after waking up, he felt sick and he had a headache. His surviving daughter, as I said, was sick for a good 48 hours after the attack. Um, but what is very interesting, the media at this time, I believe, claimed that over 1,400 children had died in Zamalka. But I was told yesterday by both civilians on the ground and also the officials there that only 50 to 100 families said they had lost children on that day. And I, I reiterate the word lost children because they have never seen those children again. Um, and in Ain Tarma, which is an area very close to where this incident happened, which this um, civilian um, witness was talking about, no families lost their family members at all. They didn't lose, none of them were affected by this alleged chemical weapon attack. And equally, even in his own building, the only civilians affected by this so-called attack were his family and two other civilians in that building. So why in this neighborhood, if, if this were a a real bona fide chemical attack are only specific civilians being affected by it and majority children. Um, and so, you know, I think this bears out what I was being told that somehow or other these children are under certain circumstances being taken from their families, they're being put into a state of, of inertia and then they are being used to, to stage these um, rescue missions or these false flag events that we've been seeing. Um, and as I said, now, you know, obviously I need to, to be continuing with that research, but on the, based on the fact that we're, we're on the brink of war here, we're on the brink of Syria being attacked on the basis of what is effectively a complete non-event in Duma. I mean, of all the false flags that we've seen, Duma is in fact the, the most for me, open and shut case of a total false flag event. Um, and we're seeing the emperor with no clothes. We're seeing the US administration. We're seeing the UN. We're seeing WHO. We're seeing the UK government and the media completely running with the story on absolutely no basis and no authenticity. I mean, it's it's quite extraordinary. It's, it's weapons of mass destruction all over again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think it's important to get this information out. And while it is only at the moment based on testimony, but at the same time, it is based on documentation of the number of families who have not been able to attend the burial of their children, for example, um, on the fact that they know they, they don't even know how those children died. Um, they don't know where they're buried. Uh, boys and girls are being buried alongside each other, which in this culture is, is, is really not acceptable. And it's very um, stressful, traumatizing for those parents to know that that is the case and not to be able to, to recognize where those children are buried. Um, and another important point that was made to me in this particular area of Zamalka, the residents of that area were driven out of their apartment blocks and their homes. 
um, and were replaced by European jihadists that were coming in or Islamists that were fighting then with Nusra Front predominantly. And out of those that have left this area now, Eastern Ghouta, to go to Idlib and then to Turkey and then back into Europe are over 280 British passports. So thank you very much, Theresa May. Um, we now have an influx of um, Nusra Front members heading back to their homes in Europe um, and to Britain.